Welcome, welcome. Uh, everyone, come on in. Have a seat. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and uh, get started here. Um, so a couple of quick announcements here. Um, and you know what? Let me go grab my notebook here. I was going to bring this up after worship just because that's when the sermon is started. But I want to hit some announcements real quick, and I don't want to forget. So, okay. So, first of all, thank you for coming. This is Landmark Community Church. We're very excited to have you here. Um, unfortunately, Pastor Barry, who would normally be up here, is not feeling the best. Um, he had his daughters in town from out of town and got whatever bug they brought in town with them. So he's not feeling the best. Asked if uh, we might be able to make do without him. So we'll just have to do the best we can here. Um, but some announcements uh, in addition to that is we are growing, which is exciting. Um, we have uh, our new uh, youth director, Zach, who's going to be coming in probably moving here towards the end of May, and in the meantime, he's going to be looking to be starting to engage with the community and see in ways that he can get involved and, uh, and, and kind of better some of the processes, try to make us a little bit more of a tight-knit community around here, especially for the younger ones. Um, and then the more we grow, the more exciting it is. So if you guys have friends who you think would be interested or would benefit from coming out, we would love to have them. And meet them and get to know them and uh, give them a chance to share in God's love as well. Uh, second, Bible class um, or Bible study is going to be tomorrow night. Uh, it's at 6.30 on Monday evenings, and we're going to be meeting right back in that room over there. So you'll walk in the same main doors you walked in just this morning, take a quick left, and we'll be in the classroom, and we're going to be talking about Romans uh, 12. Romans 12, and uh, that's going to be a great one. We're going to be talking about the marks of a true Christian and what it's like to live a lifestyle of worship. It's going to be pretty exciting. We'd love to have you guys there. Enjoy the and uh, make it a more joyous discussion. Um, lastly, and I haven't really discussed this with anybody, but um, I wanted to just kind of pose this out to the congregation, to the community. Um, since we have all been kind of coming together in the coming out of COVID season that we're kind of in. Um, I thought it would be great for us to put it on our hearts and minds uh, for ways that we could come together more as a community um, and engage more in maybe some fun activities, uh, grow in our fellowship with each other, get to know each other better. And so if anyone does have any ideas um, or just thoughts on how we might be able to organize something fun um, and all be able to come together, um, I would love to hear them, and I'm sure Pastor Barry and Sandy would also love to hear those as well. So um, any thoughts in that regard, uh, certainly come forward. And, uh, and if you feel on your heart to serve in any way or just want to start giving back, um, just ask. Um, it's a really joyous thing to be able to play a part in giving back to the community, uh, giving back to your church. Um, I can say it from personal example, just that it's, it's, it's very rewarding, very enriching. And I uh, would encourage all of you guys to experience it for yourselves. Um, so that being said, um, that is the bulk of the announcements for right now. I didn't get uh, all of the updates on health statuses and various things like that. And so I apologize if we are uh, waiting to hear about how someone is doing or not. I'm sure Pastor Barry would have that information and would be happy to tell you more if you were interested. Um, however, we are... Uh, uh, coming to today, and uh, I need to just be honest and upfront that I have no great theological degrees, that I have no sort of worldly experience to come before you and, and, and tote about or boast about. Um, but what I do have is I have the Word of God in front of me, and I am going to do my best to just simply share that with you. And so the Lord in his love and mercy will often call us up higher than we would dare to go ourselves. And so um, as we come to today um, and seek to have an experience with the Lord, uh, I pray that we would come with bared souls, open hearts, and uh, able to receive the fullness of life in Christ. So with that being said, let's go ahead and let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. 
and uh, and seek the Lord and uh, get ourselves going here. So, Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for the opportunity to come here and experience you and know you better. Lord, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You made all of heaven and earth, and the fact that we get to come before you and matter at all to you is such an honor that we do not deserve. Um, Lord, please, we just ask that you would um, remind us of our need for you, how deeply we are in need of you, and how much we have to come to you to, in order to be able to satisfy what we need and what we want. And we just ask for your favor on your people, that you would guide them and stir their hearts up towards you, that you would lead them into greater levels of success and joy and happiness, Lord, and that ultimately that would correspond and roll up to the ultimate joy and happiness, which is knowing you. Uh, Lord, we ask for the healing of our souls, that we would be renewed day by day to be more like you. We ask that Christ would become more real to us, that we might see him and the value of what he is. So help us to live in the truth of your grace, Lord, with grateful hearts, and help us to stay true to your word, Lord. Help, help me, keep me and the words of my mouth faithful to you in the light of your word. I pray that you would guard it with the power of your truth, that I might honor Christ as he should be. I uh, pray that we would come to you today with pure hearts toward you, and that you would give us new eyes to see and new tastes of your love, that we might see your glory and understand you for who you are and the amazing God that you are and all that you created us to be. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. That being said, I would invite you all to stand up and join us as we worship the Lord together. So. All right, this first one is, Oh, Come to the Altar by Elevation Worship. Sung this one before. All the ones we've sung today, we're going to have sung before. It was a busy weekend, so I had to do some reasons, So, Okay. Hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what 
Lord, our Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness. Was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Will come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as we go down. Tell the world of the treasure found. All right. What's up, you guys? Okay. This next one is an old hymn. It's called Come Thou Fount. Found of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me so melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues of rose. Praise the mounds I fix upon it, mounds of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. And I hope by thy good pleasure, seek me to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to me. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Is my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me so melodious song, sung by flaming tongues of love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts of love. Here's my heart, oh, they can seal it. Seal it for thy courts of love. Nice job, you guys. Wonderful. All right, this next one is Over My Head, Crash in, or, uh, Crash Over Me, In Over My Head it's by Bethel. This is a fun one. Okay. Mm. 
I think I'm going to do it up just a little bit from where we had it. All right, I'll adjust. Okay. To this place in my life, I'm full, but I'm not satisfied. This longing to have more of you. No, and I can feel it, my heart is convinced. I'm thirsty, my soul can't be quenched. You already know this, but still, mom, do. Whatever you want to. I'm standing easy, but I'm out where I've never been. And I feel you coming, yeah, I hear your voice on the wind. Would you come and tear down the boxes that I have? Tried to put you in that love. Come teach me who you are again. And would you take me back to the place where my heart was? Only about you and all I wanted was just to be with you. Come do whatever you want. Further and further my heart moves away from the shore Whatever it looks like, whatever may come, I am yours and Further and further my heart moves away from the shore Whatever it looks like, whatever may come, I am yours. And you laugh over me, and I'm lost all control, but I'm praying. I'm going further, I'm in over my head. Please be seated. So if there's any kiddos that want to come into the classroom with me, you guys can just follow me right out, okay? All righty. Fun. Thank you. to have little kids running around, isn't it? We got to, uh, so we had my uh, my grandfather's funeral, actually, uh, this past weekend, and uh, it was, that was a tough time, you know, and uh, have all the family out there and talking about my grandfather and how we, uh, you know, we miss him and, and how he's, you know, what kind of life he lived and how we were 
we're really excited about um, all of the amazing achievements that he had and the legacy that he left behind. And one of the really cool things that um, happened during the service was my uh, my brother's kind of like adopted son, who's pretty autistic, um, came into the uh, the sanctuary where we were kind of having the mass at him. Um, and <laughs> And this little boy, he sees me, and he sees uh, my dad uh, in the front row, and just lights up, fills with joy, fills with love, comes running in. It's like run right into the middle of the service, like in front of everybody. It's like a circle kind of sanctuary, so he's just right dead center. And he's looking at us, looking, smiling. And, uh, and, and even in the midst of, while we are all there, saddened, remembering, while, you know, this, this person who we love and revere is gone, um, we can still be, you know, stolen away by the joy of a child in a moment of sorrow like that. And uh, it's just amazing to see how the joy of a child and the joy of young life can can really infuse and bring healing to a situation that was really sad. And so it is it is life giving to have kids running around back here. It's a uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, I want to pray for us real quick uh, again as we. Uh, come out of that worship that we just want to have our hearts ready for this next uh, bit we're about to get into. And so just join me real quick in a prayer. Um, Lord, we just ask that you would allow for our hearts to be ready to you, um, that we would um, come to the altar where your arms are open wide. Lord, that we would uh, see the, the goodness in coming to your fount, that every blessing flows from it. Um, and that you would prepare our hearts to know you in a real way and that we would experience you through the goodness of your word and and the realness of who Christ was. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, at this time, with this being the first Sunday of the month, we here at Landmark, we have the tradition of partaking of the Lord's Supper and his communion. And so, at this time, I would like the elders to please come forward and begin distributing the bread and the drink Uh, that we might all take of this sacred tradition as one body. And so while they are taking a moment to get that situated, I wanted us to take a moment and just give us an opportunity to remember uh, why it is that we do this. Um, And so you guys can go ahead and just start moving it around. Maybe leave one for me. Uh, Let me grab my Bible here, though. Because if we aren't reading out of this book, we aren't doing nothing. I don't have, as I said, any sort of earthly wisdom or knowledge to provide you that would give you any sort of, uh, of help in any eternal way. And so the words that I speak to you, let's make sure they are all coming out of this book here. And what I wanted to do is uh, I believe that we're all familiar with the verses and the passages where Paul is talking about what the Lord gave to him during that supper. But what I wanted to do today is maybe give us a fresh look at the Lord's communion and what it means to eat and drink the body and blood of Christ. And so I want to pick up and just give you guys a little insight here into John chapter 6. Um, And this is maybe one of the best windows into consuming Christ. And John chapter 6 is taking place uh, following something pretty momentous happening. Jesus had just fed the 5,000 people with the five loaves and the two pieces of fish. And at this point, he um, was very popular, obviously. (laughs) He can make free food. Um, everyone wants to be around him and be fed with him and, and just and continue on with him. And it says that after Jesus had fed them and that they had uh, eaten their fill of the loaves, uh, that they were so zealously desiring after him that they were going to take and make him king by force. Well, it says that Jesus, kind of realizing this and being a little uh, sneaky himself, he sent his disciples ahead of him across the lake without him, keeping the draw of the attention of the crowds on himself. And then when the night came and things died down, 
and everything was in the dead of night, Jesus, in secret, goes and just walks across the water to go meet up with his disciples, leaving everyone back on the other side of the way. And so, uh, in John chapter 6, verses 25 to 59, uh, which is where I'm going to read from you, um, we pick up when they realize Jesus is gone. They go out and now realize they got to look after the disciples. they got to go search for them and figure out where Jesus went. And so, when they go pursuing the disciples, it says this. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. If you guys like, you can feel free to uh, go back and join your seats if you like. This might just be a moment here. Um, He says, work for the food that does not perish, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. And and then they said to him, sir, what must we be doing to do the works of God? Because they want the food. And he said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. And so they said to him, well, then what sign do you give that we may see and believe? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're really stuck on the bread. They want more food. They're hungry. They want Jesus to keep making food for them. And it says, and so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread from God is he who comes from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. They want, they want that bread. They want the bread that will give them the life, right? The physical bread, feed their needs. So Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never cast out, for I have I have not come of my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And so the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread of life. And then they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know. How does he say, I have come down from heaven? And on top of that, he doesn't look like very tasty bread. And Jesus said, Do not grumble amongst yourselves, for no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him on the last day, as it is written, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he is from the Son. He has seen the Father. But truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that no, or so that man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the world is the is, that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And so the Jews disputed amongst themselves, saying, "How can this man give us his flesh to eat?" Because they really just want the food. And so Jesus said to them, "Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day for my flesh." is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. And this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And so, come back to this moment 
with a bit of a renewed perspective. You see the importance of remembering that Jesus gave his body for us, gave his blood for us. That the belief of such things and that the belief in of such things rests the promises and the hopes for all mankind. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. And it is the coming to Christ that feeds you. It is the believing in him that waters your soul, that is the drink. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And Jesus says, and in that person, I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus' body was broken, that through him we might taste the food and the drink of eternal life. So we return to the Lord's Supper with a renewed understanding and fresh eyes to see just what it is we are doing. We see the bread given for the life of the world was the very body of Jesus. So let's keep that in mind as we approach and we come back to these familiar words from 1 Corinthians. And Paul talks about the, the supper here. For he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. Bear with me a moment. Man, these things are tricky. The night he was betrayed, that he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. All right. Now, as I said, I know I'm a young guy, um, and I have not a ton of worldly experience before you, but I hope that you will not think that these words of mine that I will say to you in the next several minutes are empty or hollow just because I lack the wisdom of age. For the words I will give to you today are the very words of Christ himself. And we shall listen to the Lord himself as he tells us the mysteries that were hidden since before times past. Things that have been kept in secret since before the foundation of the world. And namely the one of single most greatest importance to us. How a wicked sinner like you and like me can become righteous and be made right with the perfect and just judge of all the universe. How we can be freed from our sin and stand washed clean before God. Hmm. So let's find out. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to uh, take out your Bibles. I invite you to. And um, we're going to be heading into John chapter 8. Uh, we're going to go to John chapter 8, and we're going to be starting in verse 12. And as I said, I would really encourage you to follow along in your Bibles, along with me, because as I said, I've got nothing worthwhile to state outside of the authority given to me in this book. And so if you were reading along and you don't see what I am saying as having come from the Word of God or lining up with the Word of God, I want you to do me a favor and just side with Him every single time. Just side with God. If you are seeing anything, ever in the word 
and someone is telling you something that does not line up with what you know to be true in the Word of God, you side with the Word of God. Always. That is where the authority is. And so, may the words of my mouth be nothing, if not his, and if they are not his, I pray they fall on deaf ears and you would not remember them at all. So, if you are reading along and tracking with me, let's just go ahead and jump in. But before we do, you guys picking up these kind of subtle hints I'm dropping at you, kind of like uh, lobbing hand grenades of silly string? It's like, yeah, I want it. I want you guys to see what I'm saying in the Word and have it be there, okay? We good? Everyone with me? Okay, just, just check. Got to make sure everyone's awake this morning. Okay, so John chapter 8. Now, coming into John chapter 8, we're not that far off from where we just were in John chapter 6, where Jesus had fed those 5,000. Now, Jesus, when he fed those 5,000, he was actually up in the north, near his hometown, near Galilee, and he was operating uh, right off the, the coast of the lake up there. Well, now we come and we see that uh, it is the time of the Feast of Booths, and this was the time traditionally when the majority of Jews would go down to Jerusalem, and it was the time that God ordained for them that they would all go back down and remember the time when God was faithful to Israel as he led them into the promised land with his fiery burning light, that they were fed with manna from heaven during their time of wandering, and that they would sleep in booths or maybe tents as we would identify them. And so all week long, the Jews were instructed to go down to Jerusalem, and during this week they would have... Uh, all sorts of ritual festivals that would be going on that would be outlining and reminding and, and instructing the Jewish men and the Jewish people of that time all of the things that God had done for them and all of the things that God had instructed them and the ways in which they were being commanded to remain. And so all week long, they're hearing these ritual stories of following the God, following the great light of God into the promised land and how their faithfulness to follow God and trust in his deliverance was their great legacy that they were in being instructed to carry on and follow in the footsteps, trusting in the deliverance of God, following the light and the salvation of God. And so Jesus is in this midst of this festival down in Jerusalem. Everyone is there. And they're all talking all week long about the importance of following the light of God, of walking in the light of God, of saying his truth, of remaining with him and the faithfulness to him and how they as a people of the nation of Israel were instructed to always follow the Lord their God and love him with all their heart. And so, with that being said, Jesus, on the very last day of that feast, gets up and declares, likely right after they were just giving a lesson on following the light of God through the darkness, he gets up and he proclaims the following. It says again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. And so the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I come from and I know where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, but I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. And they said to him, therefore, where is your father? Well, Jesus said to them, you neither know me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. 
And these words he spoke in the treasuries, he taught them in the temple. But no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. And so he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. For where I am going, you cannot come. And the Jews said to him, will he kill himself then since he says where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And so they said to him, well, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who has sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. And they did not understand that he had been speaking about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of my own authority, but I speak just as the Father has taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he was saying these things, many believed in him. And so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, You are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. And he said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has just told you the truth from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. And they said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. And the truth does not stand in him because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the word of God. The reason you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And, Jesus, and the Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and that you have a demon? And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. But I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. And the Jews said to him, Now we know you have a demon. We know you have a demon. And Abraham died as the prophets died. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is the Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say I don't know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and he was glad. And so the Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old yet. You've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Hmm. A lot of powerful truths. 
We probably recognize a lot of iconic statements from that reading. I am the light of the world. The truth will set you free. Maybe a few other lines that sounded familiar. But I wanted to put us in the moment to see Christ as he was and hear the words that he spoke as he spoke them. Maybe we've heard that statement, the truth will set you free. But maybe we ever but maybe we never understood why the Lord said it or what he was talking about in that context. Know the truth of what? In order to be free from what? Well, Jesus tells us right here. He says, I am the light of the world, proclaiming himself to be the true light of God that will lead the people into the light of life. Jesus is certainly an exciting man. Uh, everything that he did seemed to keep people on the, the edge of their seats and looking at what he was going to do next. Um, and even though Jesus was a national sensation at this point in time, uh, he, had fe- he had fed the 5,000, his fame was spreading rapidly. He was still not so much of a somebody that these Pharisees would have respected any of his authority because these were the institution. And so Jesus wouldn't have had much standing with these people. Jesus was not a Pharisee himself. He was not a uh, typically trained man. And so Jesus comes in and proclaims after the Jews were looking and talking about this amazing feast. I am the light of the world. After they just been talking about how they needed to be in the light of God, following the light of God, always being true and faithful to that. And then Jesus gets up and says, yep, that's me. I am the light. He certainly would have kept people guessing as to what he was going to do next. Um, It says even that the Jews were looking for him at the feast before he revealed and kind of announced himself, saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he was a good man, others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, nobody talked of him. And that's what's said in John chapter 7 leading up to this. That he was a phenomenon. And that going into the feast, he was more or less being a little covert. That he was kind of not revealing himself to the masses, but kind of going in secret and so that he might be amongst them and allow them to kind of settle into the week before he really started things up. And as he was coming into this week, it was said that the Jews had actually sent people to arrest him if he should make himself known. And when they went and they tried to actually apprehend him and take him into custody, that the men who were sent to do that were so stopped and so shaken by the words that he spoke that they did nothing. Imagine if the police came to church today to arrest, you know, me off the stage, and then all of a sudden they walked in and they were just shaken. And they went back to their their captain, and the captain's like, why didn't you arrest him? They were like, We've never heard anything spoken like this man before. We were afraid. We didn't want to touch the guy. It's like, whoa, that's wild. The mere power of what he was saying prevented these men from wanting to have anything to do with bringing him and apprehending him. Why? Because he was electric. This was the first time in the history of the world that God entered in and actually gave man the average man a chance to hear the truths of God spoken from his very mouth. And so he was not stopped or arrested, it says, because his time had not yet come. By the time of the last day of the feast, because it stood up on the third day and he started saying some stuff, and Pharisees were not thrilled about that, but come the time of the last day, he goes all out. And this is his time. And Jesus gets up and goes on to say that the light of God that you were following through the wilderness was me. That the light of God that you were always meant to follow, 
is me. And the Pharisees are like, well, who in the blue blazes are you? And he says, basically, or they say, basically, you can't just get up here and declare one-offs about yourself. We don't just believe every person that starts making fantastic claims around here, especially when those claims are about the greatness of yourself. We don't just believe everyone who goes talking about themselves. And the reason is because they're challenged by his power, of course. But So they have this dance going on, actually. And if you understand the law, the Jewish law of Deuteronomy and what they're doing, they're actually playing this, this game of, of uh, tactical positioning, trying to maneuver the other into making a mistake. Um, like lawyers gaining and jockeying for position over the argument. This is what goes on. Jesus is claiming to be the new prophet that Moses would raise up from God, according to Deuteronomy 18, 15. And so let me just read that very quickly. You don't have to flip there yourselves, but I will give you the words here. So Moses, going to leave the people, afraid that they would be led astray and taken by every wind or doctrine or what have you. He's afraid of that, but Moses hears from God that something will occur. So Moses declares to the people, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from among your brothers, and it is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired the Lord your, uh, just as you desired of the Lord your God, uh, at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, "Let us not hear again the voice of the Lord our God, or see His great fire, lest we die." And the Lord said to me, "They are right in what they have spoken." He said, "I will raise up for them a prophet from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it." So Jesus proclaims that he is the one to come who speaks the words of God. And so, because he comes in claiming to speak the words of God and claiming a, uh, a, a, a claim from the law, they respond with their own retort from the law and have a legal rebuttal. Since Jesus is making a claim from the law, they reference the next chapter of the law which says a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or wrong in connection with any offense that he's committed. Only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be established. And if a malicious witness arises the accused uh, to accuse a person of wrongdoing, both parties shall appear before the Lord, before the priests who are the judge in the office of those days. Now, for the priests to respond to Jesus who was just saying that he was the prophet that was to come, and them to respond with the notion that he had to prove that on the basis of two witnesses, it's not very good understanding of the law. It's actually a total cheap shot, because they're not actually bringing any accusations. Jesus himself is not bringing forward accusations necessarily himself. He is maintaining and proclaiming the truths of God. He hasn't committed any wrongs against anybody, and so they're not. he's not coming to them and proclaiming to them all of these convictions or so to speak. He says, I'm not judging you. I'm proclaiming you the truths about God. And so what is this business you're requiring witnesses of? It shouldn't even really be the case. But with this, in fact, we can actually see that these parties have to dispute before the priests. That the law requires the witnesses to go and dispute before the priests. And so what the priests are trying to do is they're trying to get this back into their wheelhouse. If we can connect this so that we're the judges of Jesus, then he has to convict, then he has to come and play on our terms. Well, Jesus, not really afraid of that, moves in to that game. And the judgment that they wish to render on him by forcing him into this position is actually 
seen in Deuteronomy 13 that they want to ultimately bring about, which says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder, he tells you, comes true. But he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet nor dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast. But that prophet, that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death because he is taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way that which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge evil from the midst of your land. They meant to kill him. And Jesus had accused them of wanting to kill him before. He said it for the first time back in chapter 7, verse 19, and they actually deny it then. They say, you have a demon who is trying to kill you. They don't deny it here. They don't deny it here. They want to kill him. They don't bother denying. But Jesus, seeing all that is in front of him, does not waver. He moves right in on their turf. He takes their bait, and he goes in and engages them on their authoritative framework. And he declares to them, God the Father is the witness. God the Father is my second witness. And now they're prosecuting him. Now they have him, they think, on the ropes. They say, oh, your father. Who is your father? But every answer he gives leaves them a little bit more taken aback because they couldn't bring a charge against him that would turn the hearts of their people from him and allow them to move against him because all the time he had been speaking to them and healing them and preaching to them about the kingdom of God. And so, with the idea that God is their witness and they know not God, nor him, he then goes on the offensive in verse 21. And it says, so he says to them, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Takes the ground for truth and uses the public forum that the Pharisees are now engaging with him on as an opportunity to shine the light on their evil and show how they have clearly not held up the words of Scripture. Jesus says, you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. And they try and confuse the matter by asking, well, what does he mean? Does he mean to kill himself since he says he's going away and you can't come with him? Who are you? I seriously doubt this was asked to derail him in any ways. He says, for unless you believe I am he, you will die in your sin. Believe I am he. Jesus said, I am who I've been telling you I am from the beginning. From the beginning. I have much to judge about you, he says to these Pharisees, because they are constantly coming against him. And they get more than he bargained for with that statement. Or they, or they get more than they bargained for with that statement when he says, I have been telling you who I am from the beginning. As a thunderous word that comes from the pages of history down through to the beginning of very right now. He has been trying to tell the Jews since the beginning of time. Trying to tell man since the beginning of time who he is. And man has just not listened. They have not understood that God is a good God that wants the best for them. And they rebel every time. We all rebel. And so, Jesus says, I am exactly who I have been telling you I have been from the beginning. He said to them, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Mm. The truths of Jesus. And he ends that statement by saying, basically, 
Which of you can come against me? I always do the things that are pleasing to my Father. I say the words that I am hearing from him. I do nothing of my own authority. And as he said these things, it says that many believed on him. And so in this moment where Jesus captures the hearts and the souls of the people for a moment, he uses the opening to share with us one of the greatest mysteries ever uttered. It says, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free from what? What do we need freedom from? They ask, we're offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anybody. Which, as an aside, is probably one of the dumbest things anyone's ever said. The Jews, basically the entire time they've existed, have been enslaved or oppressed or beaten up by somebody. There's like a 400-year window where they get the good spot, and that's it. That's it in their like 3,000-year history. From the time of the beginning, basically enslaved by the Egyptians. They leave that promised land. They go into the promised land. Then they get oppressed and beaten up by the Midians, the Philistines. And then they get conquered by the Babylonians and then the Persian Medes and then the Greeks. And now, even right now, to this day, they're under Roman occupation. So the whole idea that they've never been slaves is just ignorant and stupid and devoid of all knowledge of history. However, Jesus, in his condescension, entertains the question. Free from what? We're offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. Again, it's a really stupid statement. But Jesus gives us the opportunity from that teeing up in order to say, truly, truly, in verse 34, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain forever. And so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus declares that they will not believe, though. And that the reason is because they are not from God. They are not from God, and so they will not hear the words of God. And they hate him because their deeds are evil. And Jesus shows this to the people because he says, as they proclaim Abraham their father, he says, this is not what Abraham did. Attack the man who proclaimed the truths of God. Abraham believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness. He says, you're doing the works of your father. And they say, well, God is our father. He says, God is your father. You would love me. I came from God, and he sent me. And so with nothing left to say, they attack him personally. As he goes and he hits them with the juggler, you are of your father the devil. Oh, jeez. Love to clean that up. So sorry, everyone. But you are of your father, the devil. He is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And your will is to do his will. And so with that, he shines the light on them and reveals the darkness of who they are. And all they have left to do is attack him with ad hominems. Aren't you a demon? Aren't you a Samaritan? Now we know you're a demon. Because when you run out of actual things to argue about, all you can do is attack the person. And so they resort to that. Jesus says, you'll never taste death if you keep my words. And they're like, well, now we know you have a demon because everybody dies. Who do you make yourself out to be? And he's like, Abraham saw my day. They're like, you're not even 50. You know Abraham? He says, I was. Before Abraham was, I am from all time, and takes the divine name upon himself, the name that God declared to Moses that was his name, that he would go and he would tell the people that the I am sent you. And that Jesus, when he comes before his people and declares to them who he is, he says, I am the I am. The one who is and was and is to come the maker of heaven and the earth, the one who holds the keys of death, and the decider of men's souls. 
So whoever keeps his word will never taste death. But Jesus is reluctant, really, to come out and say this big reveal because Jesus' glory is from God, the Father. He doesn't glorify himself. There's no need to because there is one who seeks his glory perfectly. Jesus says, if I were to say I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. And so I will say it. I do know him and I keep his word. And so, because tensions are running hot, Jesus has just declared them sons of the devil. They've just declared him a demon. And so when Jesus comes out and says, no, I am the very God who you say you worship, they revile and they react as if they had been just shown every bit of evil that they were, and they react with all the evil that you would expect. It says that they pick up stones to throw at him. That when God came and revealed himself to man and to those whom he had come to, who had declared himself to, who he had saved from Egypt, who he had led through the wilderness, who he had protected and guarded from all those stupid decisions they had made that led them into endless oppression, and when he came to them and revealed to him the truth of God that would set men free from their sin, they wanted to murder him. Because they're evil. And they're of their father, the devil, as are we all until God changes us. And so what do we take away from this Story. What do we take away from this exchange, this knowledge of what happened with Jesus and what he said? Well, this is what we're to understand. That Jesus is the true light that leads people out of darkness. That Jesus is the promised prophet of God who was to come after Moses, who would speak the very words of God. That he would proclaim the truth and that the knowledge of the truth of Jesus and what he did would lead to people to become free from their sins. Because everyone who sins is a slave of sin. And Jesus says the, the slaves will not remain forever in the house. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And you will live forever. And you will never taste death. But you will have the light of life in Christ for all eternity. And so if anyone here or anyone listening anywhere hereafter is of God, they will hear the words of God and respond to him. And if you find yourself in that camp this morning, let me tell you what you should do. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the I am, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is why Jesus is the true light of the world. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just ask that you would move in this space. That you would allow for our hearts to see you with renewed vigor. You'd transform our minds to desire you and to chase after the things that are pleasing to you, Lord, that we might see Christ as he is, as worthy above all, as the treasure worth trading everything in the field for. Lord, that we might see that the freedom that we can have in Christ, the eternal life and the option that we can be saved through what he did is the truth worth searching your whole life to figure out and find and will not put you to shame. Lord, I pray that you would move and that you would save souls using your word as you proclaim that you would. I pray that anything today that was said that was not of you would be forgotten and that you would cement the truth of who you are deep into our minds as we go forth and we seek to love you and love others 
for your glory and for your kingdom. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Thank you very much. Um, let's have, who do we want? Let's have Tanya come up and pray for us and end the day in prayer. Come on, Tanya. Get on up here, girl. It's real easy. You just say a prayer. Close us. Wish us well. Oh my gosh, this is weird. All right. Um, Father, we just thank you for today. Father, thank you for the message that we were able to listen to. Um, we just pray, God, that you place a head of protection around us as we leave out of the building today. Father, we pray um, that you pour your love over us and your peace as we go about our week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Go in peace.